All right, so we talked about all the structure, the osteology, um, the stability, and the muscles of the hip. Um, and now we're going to really talk more about the function. And that's why I call this section functional considerations of the hip. So um, all of the... When we talk about the muscles in isolation, we talk about what an individual one does, it's not really what happens in real life. Obviously, the muscles are acting together. Nobody's acting in isolation. And um, not a single one of them is acting in isolation, in fact. Um, and so a lot of our motions, we talked about synergists um, in the muscle chapter, synergists and co-contractors and neutralizers and stabilizers, that sort of thing. And the force couple... Um, is what we're going to talk about now because the anterior and active anterior tilting the, of the pelvis is created by a force couple involving the hip flexor muscles and the extensor muscles of the low back, um, specifically the erector spinae. Um, so actively anterior, anteriorly tilting, the um, hip flexors have to um, pull inferiorly on the anterior portion of the pelvis and the erector spinae pulls superiorly on the posterior direction of the pelvis. So the, the example that they use in the book it's like turning a steering wheel where one hand pulls upward as the other pulls downward to create that anterior tilt. So in lab we will practice um, anterior and posterior tilt positions Probably those of you that um, teach Pilates are used to teaching this all the time. But um, just right now, if you stand up and you put your thumbs on your anterior superior iliac spines, ASISs, and you put your um, index fingers on the pubic symphysis, um, if those are level in the same plane, um, then you are in a neutral pelvis. If the ASISs are anterior to the pubic symphysis, you are in an anterior pelvic tilt. And if the ASISs are posterior to the pubic symphysis, you're in a posterior pelvic tilt. So there are times when we might want to um, encourage or teach either anterior tilt or posterior tilt depending on the needs of our patients. Um, certain conditions um, you want to bias towards an anterior tilt, such as herniated um, discs and um, some uh, people who sit a lot and get into that um, trunk forward position. Um, we want to teach an anterior pelvic tilt. And uh, for osteoporosis, that's another um, example. But um, for people that have... Um, spondylolisthesis or stenosis, we want to get more into a posterior pelvic tilt. And so um, we have to know what muscles um, do we need to lengthen or strengthen in order to um, get someone into the proper tilt that we want. So in this case, if somebody has weak hip flexors, um, they might have difficulty getting into an anterior tilt. Or if they have tight trunk extensors, tight erector spinae, they might have difficulty getting an anterior tilt. So um, the abdominal muscles act as proximal stabilizers for the hip flexors. So the hip flexor muscles um, a lot of times are dependent on the stabilization provided by the abdominal muscles. I've said this before and I'll probably say it again, but we need um, proximal stability for distal mobility. So with weakened abdominal muscles, if you're lying supine and you attempt to flex, that, flex the hip um, and raise your leg, um, a lot of times the uh, result is an unwanted anterior pelvic tilt, an excessive lumbar lordosis. So we're going to try this in lab and we're going to see what muscles do we have to activate to prevent that lumbar lordosis. And um, I think, well, you can tell from the bottom picture, well, from both of those pictures really, is the abdominal uh, muscles really have to be activated to prevent that anterior pelvic tilt. So we're going to try it in lab and it'll be fun. Just like everything in lab, right? Okay, so the posterior pelvic tilt is produced by the force couple created by the abdominal muscles and the hip extensors. So the um, rectus abdominis and the obliques 
pull the um, pubic symphysis it, um, superiorly, so they pull the anterior part of the pelvis in a superior direction. The um, hip extensors pull the posterior part of the pelvis into an inferior direction, and we're turning the steering wheel the other direction. So um, a lot of times, like I said before, exercises involving a posterior pelvic tilt are used to address um, low back problems such as spondylolisthesis and uh, lumbar stenosis. So we're trying to get out of that um, lordotic lumbar position by doing a posterior pelvic tilt. So if somebody, there's the, the picture in the book on page 249 where the person with the tight hip flexors, they can't fully extend their hip until they get into a um, more lordotic position with that anterior pelvic tilt um, because they just don't have the range of motion in their um, hip flexors. They have that uh, contracture going on. So um, then talking about uh, some of the helpers for hip extension because hip extension is a major player in walking, running, hiking. We have to be able to um, push off that back leg so um, activities such as running or jumping really require a lot of a really high hip extension torques. The position of hip flexion elongates the hip extensors, better enabling them to produce large forces. So um, a lot of hip adductor muscles are converted to extensors when the hip is in a flexed position um, because we change their line of pull. Remember, if the, um, if the line of pull is anterior, um, to the medial lateral axis, um, it's you're in a position for flexion. If the line of pull is posterior to the medial lateral axis, you're in a position for hip extension. So when we get in that flex position, like the guy in the picture climbing up the hill, now we've put our adductors in a position to help those extensors and um, and give us more torque. So the, they say in the book, it's like switching gears in the car. The position of hip flexion strongly enables um, and engages the available extension torque of a lot of different hip muscles. So um, that's pretty cool. You can use your muscles for um, things that uh, aren't their primary uh, capability um, in order to uh, meet the demands of what you're currently doing. So um, hip abductors, um, we... We did that lever analysis um, in the last module um, with uh, hip abduction, and that was an open chain. But hip abductors play a really critical role in controlling frontal plane pelvis movements in closed chain when you're walking. So during the stance phase of gait, so that's a closed chain um, on the stance foot, um, the hip abductor muscles of the stance leg have to hold the pelvis level. So if those guys aren't um, holding the pelvis level, the contralateral side of the pelvis is going to drop. So as the hip abductors stabilize the pelvis, they also create significant forces against the hip. So if somebody has an unstable or painful hip joint, we're going to have to deal with that. And we're going to talk about a little about how to... Um, improve the, the torque on the hip joint and unload it a little bit. So um, if you probably, I always say, if you just hand someone a cane and said, uh, see you later, <laughs> or, you know, learn how to walk with that, I'm not going to tell you anything. A lot of times they will figure it out the incorrect way. Um, they will either hold it in their dominant hand, that's pretty common because, you know, we're used to holding things in our dominant hand, whether it's the appropriate side or not, um, or they will do what I call Hollywood cane walking, which, like Mr. Bates on Downton Abbey or um, the guy on House, um, where they lean on the cane on their affected side. Okay, well, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't unload the hip at all, and it's not the proper use of a cane. So um, we're going to use therapeutic measures, principles of joint protection, to reduce large forces crossing a painful or weakened hip. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a, the cane in the hand opposite the affected hip. So we're using, to, we're using it to reduce force production requirements of the hip abductors and reduce the compressive forces that may further injure the joint, or we're reducing the compressive forces so we can unload the joint a little bit. So 
by using the cane in the opposite hand, um, the hip abductors on the stance leg um, can share the load a little bit between the cane and they are not having to contract as hard to keep you stable. You'll also see the person with Trendelenburg gait, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, they, they have a lot of trunk sway when they're walking and then you get them on a cane on the opposite side and they can walk in a more level way that's putting fewer um, forces on their hip and certainly fewer compressive forces and less torque as well. So in the book there's a um, there's a picture of the um, effects of the cane and it has um, the, the moment arm and all that other stuff and I don't expect you to know that. <laughs> I just want you to know that the, um, the cane in the opposite hand um, produces force that unloads the compressive forces in the hip. Okay, And uh, if you have questions about that let me know but we'll, we'll figure it out together and we'll practice it in the lab as well. So um, we're going to go back to the Trendelenburg sign but the, talking about the sagittal plane function of the adductor muscles, um, regardless of hip position, the extensor head of the adductor magnus acts as an extensor, but the rest of them can act as flexors or extensors depending on the hip position, um, and they can add um, flexion and extension torque. So switching from flexion to extension um, kind of explains why um, groin pulls and adductor injuries are more common when running because you're having to switch function on those muscles a lot. They're very more they're very much more susceptible um, to injuries because of how we're using them. So um, reversal of muscle function and I talked about this a little bit in the muscle chapter normal muscle function is when the insertion moves towards the origin. Reversal of muscle function is when the origin moves towards the insertion. So a lot of times if that happens in closed chain because the distal segment is um, the more distal end of the muscle is fixed and so the proximal side moves. So when you stand on one leg, the distal segment of the um, hip abductors, which is the femur, becomes more stable and the proximal segment, which is the pelvis or the oscoxi, is um, less stable and so the origin moves towards the insertion. The um, top of the pelvis along the iliac crest moves towards the greater trochanter. So without the hip abductors contracting um, to, to cause that reversal of muscle function, the pelvis drops on the opposite side. Um, and this is called Trendelenburg gait or Trendelenburg sign. So if the right hip abductors are weak, when you're standing on the right, the left side drops. There are a couple of videos in the Canvas module that um, demonstrate this, and we're also going to practice it in lab. So the muscles that are weak in this case are the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. And um, so what's happening is they cannot do that reversal of muscle function where the origin moves towards the insertion and the opposite side of the pelvis drops. So I want you to try it, try standing there, put your hands on the muscles and feel it, and I want you to get an idea of what that feels like. And then we'll go through it in lab and hopefully it'll um, click. So this is the, the picture. Um, on the picture A, it's what we call an uncompensated Trendelenburg. So he is, in this picture, his weak hip abductors are on the left and his right hip is dropping. Um, the compensated response is he moves his trunk over to the weak side to um, straighten out the line of gravity, basically. So um, his, his trunk is moving over to the right side because that right side of the pelvis is dropping and the compensation is to move the trunk. The hip is still weak and the pelvis is still dropping, but the trunk moves the line of gravity over the base of support. So the reversal of muscle function, the left in this picture, the left hip abductors contract to keep the pelvis steady when the right leg is lifted. When those left hip abductors are weak, the right side of the pelvis drops. So remember, it's the contralateral side from the weak side that it drops. It is possible, of course, to have bilateral Trendelenburg where both sides are weak and then 
there's quite a lot of um, transverse plane movement um, and frontal plane movement in the pelvis when someone's walking. And it looks like a waddling motion, sort of. And it's very unsteady and uh, definitely increases someone's fall risk. So um, I just have a little summary of the hip innervation. Um, femoral nerve, remember, does the anterior muscles, ones that primarily perform flexion, iliacus, rectus femoris sartorius, and a little bit of pectineus. Um, obturator nerve is primarily ones that do um, adduction, gracilis pectineus, um, adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus. Sciatic nerve is primarily the extensors, the posterior side, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, long head of the biceps femoris, and the adductor magnus. The, um, the superior gluteal nerve gets the the more lateral gluteal muscles, if you want to think of it that way, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and TFL, tensor fasciolata. The inferior gluteal nerve gets the gluteus maximus. So like all the joints of the body, the, the hip needs mobility and stability. Not just one, but it needs both. So the ball and socket structure for the joint gives you mobility in all three planes, but it's also super stable because that acetabulum is deep. You have the labrum to add more stability and super strong ligaments, really nice, big, strong ligaments that are helping stabilize that joint. So because of its central location, the dysfunction of the hip can generate a number of problems up and down the kinematic chain, such as low back and lower limb problems. And in the next, um, the next chapter, the next module, um, we're going to do a group project where we talk about patellofemoral dysfunction. And one of the areas that can affect patellofemoral dysfunction is um, hip weakness and problems with hip alignment. So um, one of the groups is going to have that as their um, study area for patellofemoral dysfunction. Um, facilitating proper alignment and function of the hip often treats dysfunction in the low back region and in the more distal lower limbs. So sometimes if you're having knee issues, you actually have to um, improve function at the hip in order to improve function at the knee. Same thing, hip problems can cause low back issues and you can resolve the lower back issues by treating those hip issues.